Rivers of blood and piles of rubble mark the wounds that cover both Palestine and Israel, which are made of the same soil and water and all inhabited by people, plain people. Those wounds are traces of a subterranean battle involving Jews, Arabs, and plenty of secret partners, a battle that now threatens the entire world in the manner that the killing of Archduke Ferdinand of the Austro-Hungarian Empire threatened Europe in 1914. The one thing that the politicians have not been saying to you in the days after the attacks that left Israelis and then many more Palestinians dead is that we should make sure we know what happened before we take any action. That we should be sure that we know who our true enemies are before we start swinging a sword. They know full well that once the Israel Defense Forces start the process of starving and killing the impoverished people of Gaza, that there will be no way back to reason, to level-headed policy. We will be committed to a horrific war that we never wanted. This is the whole point. Once you tell millions of people trapped in a ghetto to disappear or else, then anything, any horrible thing, becomes possible. And the Jewish protesters in New York City demanding that all Palestinians in Gaza be eliminated were clearly crisis actors, not thoughtful citizens. We are witnessing a show, but the deaths that will follow will be no show. This rush to action to judgment, this jump deep into clouded hysteria is no accident. No, this is not accidental. It was the whole point, the whole purpose of the media blitz. Just as was the case after the 9-11 incident to corral us into taking irreversible steps that will not only leave tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands dead in Palestine, but that could easily extend to a war between Israel and Iran, the United States and Iran, or the United States, NATO, and Israel against Russia and Iran. That is to say, a world war. The world war that some sick souls have been hankering after for years. Let me first declare that I do not know what actually happened. That puts me light years ahead of all those media pundits, politicians, and government officials who assume that they know everything based on the news sources, intelligence reports, and gossip that have been wrong in almost every case for the last 23 years. We are forced by circumstances to speculate as to what might have happened. I must speculate here in good faith in accord with the scientific method while asking to be corrected where I fall short. We do not have time to wait 50 years for the classified directives to be made public. First, this attack attributed to Hamas is of a scale and intensity that could not possibly have been carried out without the full knowledge of the Israeli Defense Forces. Granted that the millions they pay out to informants in the occupied territories and the tens of billions that they pay for censors, drones, satellites, and the most advanced surveillance technology in the world, partly funded by the American taxpayer. We also know 
that Israel's President Netanyahu faces extreme unpopularity with the vast majority of the Jewish population that is enraged by his corruption and engaged in massive protests against his vicious oppression of Jewish workers. Elements in the Israeli military and intelligence have stated that they are in clear opposition to Netanyahu and that they will not tolerate his seizure of control of the judicial branch of government as part of a bid to take over the entire country. That is precisely what he has done since those attacks using the shock doctrine. What better a moment to play footsie with Hamas, which has operated with corrupt elements of the Israeli military before, and to create an incident that leads to war. Is it not simply Israel's own little 9-11? But it just starts there. Now that the United States has completely bought into this war on Hamas, with President Biden referring to Hamas as, quote, pure, unadulterated evil, we can feel that the door has been thrown open for something even bigger, even more horrific. We also know that pure, unadulterated evil is precisely the language used by the Nazi party against the Jews before they were disenfranchised put in camps, and then exterminated. It is not simply that Israel, with the backing of all the governments major of the major industrial countries, will cut off water, food, and electricity to Palestinians who are living in squalor while bombing their apartment houses to pieces and driving them into the sea. A war with Iran is just around the corner all we need is some headline on CNN screaming that somehow Iran was involved. In Israel, of course, not involved. That missing link will be like the evidence for Al-Qaeda that suddenly appeared after 9-11. Iran has always expressed support for Hamas and a war with Iran will naturally follow the path already carefully laid towards war with Russia and Iran, and in turn will drag in NATO and just about every country whose leaders have signed those classified agreements for intelligence sharing and military cooperation with the United States or with NATO over the past few years of international diplomatic carnivals. This creation of an unaccountable chain of command for the militaries of each country in the West, farmed out to private IT firms like Amazon, Google, and Facebook, follows precisely the model employed to launch World War I. After the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand, the nations of England, France, and Russia followed a plan for war like clockwork, as if the politicians and generals had been replaced by pre-programmed machines. Later, the world would learn that these countries had signed a series of secret treaties that overruled all national debate on military action and made horrific world war possible. You might ask, fairly, who could possibly want a world war that will leave tens of millions, hundreds of millions dead, and that might even end life on Earth in a nuclear holocaust? Only a psychopath, you might think, would want that. Ah, there's the rub. For behold, the world is run by psychopaths these days. World War offers two precious gifts to the psychopathic rich and powerful in the days and months before it leads to mass slaughter and calamity for all. First, 
World war reinforces the power of the state, giving new authority to corrupt and discredited institutions, whether it's the Center for Disease Control, Harvard University, or the New York Times, the institutions that drag humanity through the mud during the COVID-19 fraud and the controlled demolition of society by global finance. Ratcheting things up to world war may be the only thing left in the toolboxes of the Netanyahu and Biden administrations at this point. Second, world war creates massive consumption and demand. The killing of millions will create demand for corporations to supply weapons and f fuel and other products and an excuse to seize control of the means of finance, production, and distribution. The deep contradictions of a narcissistic consumption culture and the dangers resulting from the systematic overproduction thus generated can be swept under the rug, at least for a little while, by such a war. As far as the myopic politicians are concerned, the bigger and more destructive the war, the better. The government of Israel is dominated by the super rich, as are the governments of the United States, Russia, China, Germany, and even Iran. The war between cultures and ethnicities being planned serves to cover over a more systematic war of the few against the vast majority of humanity a global class war. Did I mention that the rich are psychopaths? They are willing to take any risk, especially if it is others who will do the dying in order to protect themselves and their asses, I mean their assets. Let us talk also about the peculiar relationship of the State of Israel and the United States. If we want to pull back from the edge of world war, we must first start to speak honestly about what Israel is and what it is not, and how Israel is oddly, conversely, paradoxically tied to the United States. Israel and the United States have a lot in common, and perhaps that is one of the reasons that they have been so strangely bound together. Palestine, as a place of refuge for the Jews, was imagined as a dream in Europe from the 1890s and especially in the 1930s. Jews who suffered terrible discrimination and violence and had suffered it for centuries found hope in Palestine. The Jewish settlements in Palestine offered hope to those who were rounded up later in ghettos, deported to concentration camps, and packed into trains for passage to the death camps. After World War II, the State of Israel was established, and it also offered hope of a homeland to surviving Jews, one that they thought could be defended, unlike the ghetto, unlike the ghettos of Eastern Europe that were ruthlessly liquidated. But that homeland did not appear from nowhere, and it was not granted to the Jews by God. It had been thousands of years since Jews had their kingdom there. No, that state of Israel was bound up with the British imperialist interests and other causes of a completely different nature. No, the land was seized from the Palestinians who had lived there for centuries, and they were driven from their homes by the Jewish settlers, just as Jews had been driven from their homes by Germans, Poles, and Ukrainians. The promise of a covenant between this new Israel and the sorrowful Jews left behind after the slaughter in the camps of Poland and Russia required that the Palestinian people disappear just as Jews had been disappeared. 
This was the sin that could not be erased as hard as Jews tried thereafter. There were plenty of Jews who went to the United States too and they found in America great promise an opportunity that could not be found in a, in a Europe with its deep hostilities against Jews. But the freedom for Jews in America was also built on the backs of African Americans worked to death. The wide prairies and teeming cities where Jews found new hope had been seized from the native people who were crammed into reservations like the Palestinians were forced into Gaza, like the Jews had been forced into ghettos. I need to pause here and to mention that my father's family were also Jews who came to America with nothing. Their village outside of Budapest was destroyed during the Holocaust and no longer remains. They found great opportunities here. This tragedy of America and its ties to the Middle East and to Israel is directly related to me, even though I have never stepped foot in Israel. An odd relationship developed between the United States and Israel over the last 80 years. It was not a clear relationship, it was not legally defined, and it was tied to the long shadow of the British Empire that had reached its fingers deep into both countries, especially during the Second World War. We cannot talk about Israel without talking about the spider's web, the hidden network of finance that lies in the remnants of the British Empire. You see, Israel was founded in Palestine, a British imperial experiment to extend British power into the Middle East and to get control of petroleum. Israel should be thought of as a parallel to the British Virgin Islands, the Cayman Islands, Bermuda, and other British colonies that became places to hide money, to pay off people in secret, and ultimately became the unaccountable tax-free homes for many multinational corporations that claimed to be American. Israel, behind the honest efforts of Holocaust survivors to build a new life, became part of that spider's web of money, intelligence, and special services for the rich and powerful. As the wealth of the few in the United States and Israel increased, as the militaries of both countries became larger and larger, a part of the economies, a new level of corruption, unimaginable corruption, set in and reached to the bone in the United States and in Israel. The United States and Israel ended up having the closest ties in military intelligence, and yet there was no formal alliance treaty. There was, there was not the legal basis that was required. This special relationship with Israel was not to be found in the capital, nor in the Neset. No, the heart of this alliance was something informal among military contractors, intelligence subcontractors, financial institutions tied to both countries, and also to London, and other informal relationships often controlled by the extremely wealthy, often classified. Massive amounts of money, supposedly for the defense of Israel, floated around in this spider web of military contractors just out of sight in both countries, or maybe not. No one could be sure where that money really went. That deepening corruption, that underground river of filth that flowed beneath both the United States and Israel fed a rot in institutions, and that made the 9-11 incident possible. Dark powers in the United States, in Israel and elsewhere, created a crisis that drew attention away from domestic 
corruption under the Bush administration in 2001 and launched a global war that would distract the world for over 20 years. 9-11 was blamed on Islam and was used as an excuse to wage war on numerous countries who had little or nothing to do with any of this terrorism. The billionaires made Israel and they made the United States their toys using the armies, the economies, and the technologies of these two nations to advance their plans for world domination. The hidden nature of the U.S.-Israel ties was perfect for their preparations. The informal alliance was the best place to plan for the conquest of the world by global finance, just out of sight, in the corners, on the edges. The commercialization of the surveillance and control technology developed by Israel in the occupied territories and its employment around the world is the hidden part of the current operation, but it must be taken just as seriously. At the very moment that the Israeli Defense Forces plan to level Gaza, the United States, the European Union, and many other countries are implementing radical policies to limit free speech on the internet and to control people through surveillance. This is no coincidence. It is the underbelly of the military plan. The expertise in Israel on surveillance, tracking, in internet control, and in psychological control that was developed in the occupied territories has been privatized and sold to corporate powers around the world who use it to track and manipulate citizens in the United States, in China, in Germany and Russia, in virtually every country using those technologies controlled by Israeli IT and intelligence firms. Those forces, which have nothing to do with working Jews in Israel, but everything to do with the Israel that is embedded in the spider's web, have taken over the IT functions of local governments across the United States, and increasingly, they are the space where the functions of police are being outsourced to unaccountable forces. Whether it is the border with Mexico or downtown Detroit, the United States is becoming occupied territories. To say the United States is occupied by Israel is not correct, but Israel is being used as the conduit, the means to extend corporate control over us, over Israel, over Palestine, and the world. Finally, we must recognize that as this scheme for total global control starts to fall apart, the rich and powerful will quickly launch into a Blame the Jews campaign, just as they did in the 1930s. The financial collapse will be blamed on Israel and the vilified Jew. Do not deceive yourself. If Netanyahu calls Palestinians animals today, future politicians in the United States and Europe will not hesitate to refer to Jews in similar terms to avoid exposing the true hidden hand of the spider economy that is spread out through the tainted ashes of the British Empire. And so, here we are. We see the children of the Jews who watched furious Germans and Poles screaming for the murder of Jews. And what are they doing? They are collaborating with the dark forces who are planning the liquidation of all Palestinians in Gaza, which is psychological preparation for something far more terrible in the offing. A horrible karma has come to pass. What do we do? No one in the halls of government in the United States dares to admit that this attack on Israel may have been, probably was, planned by a desperate hand of rich Israelis 
as a way of making sure that their corrupt administration stayed in power. But everyone in Washington knows that forbidden truth. They are just afraid to say it. No one dares admit that this campaign to flatten Gaza is perfectly designed to spark a war with Iran, which will lead inevitably to war with Russia and then to world war. But everyone in Washington knows exactly what is happening and they know why. Those in the halls of government looking so respectable and authoritative repeat fictions, platitudes, and fairy tales while knowing in their hearts that something quite different is going on, that the gates of hell have been opened wide even if they are decorated with pretty ornaments to make them seem less dangerous. And so here we are in the age of monsters. What is the answer? There is only one answer. And it's not a matter of military hardware or IT for intelligence. Peace is the answer. But it has to be a real peace, a spiritual peace, a peace rooted in the moral, in the righteous, in the truth. No frauds can bring us peace now. And what is the solution? There is only one solution. There is only one medicine in the medicine cabinet that has any chance of curing this gangrene of the soul. It is the caustic purgative that we are loath to drink that bitter tonic known as truth.